Hey, good morning, Journey. Great to see you this morning. Glad you're here. Good morning. Hey, I'm so glad. And for those of you online, hello, sweetheart. How are you? I love that. Hey, I, it's going to be hot this week. How hot is it? It's going to be so hot. This is what I grew up in Ohio with. It's going to be so hot that chicken are going to be giving hard-boiled eggs when they birth those birth with those eggs. It's going to be so hot that when you go to milk a cow, it'll come out evaporated milk. Come on, those are really pretty funny. Yeah. And what do you do when it gets hot? What do you do? Just ask Josh. You do whatever. Oh, that, where's Josh when I need him? That was, anyway, I'm just sharing that with you as a public service announcement. That has nothing to do with the sermon at all. I was trying to keep up with Jim Jessup last week because he's quite the jokester. And he is fabulous and hilarious and love having him. Sorry I missed it. But it was great to watch it online with you and to be a part of that with you. Grateful that he came. And what a great person to speak at a grad Sunday and having him share for all of our graduates and our teenagers. We are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 12. You can turn there in your Bible. If you need a Bible, we have them for free in the back. We'd love to have you alongside with us or use your electronic device and follow along. What we've been doing is a series called God, What God Notices. And I'm using these stories from Samuel to show you that God doesn't just notice the prayers, the words that come out of your mouth. God notices your heart cries. God doesn't just notice what you intend to do. God notices your actual actions and your obedience. And God doesn't just notice what you are doing as far as good works. God is looking for your holy consecration in your life. And today we're going to look at another story out of Samuel. It's in 1 Samuel 12, and this one is at the end of his career as leader of Israel. Now, if you're not familiar with Samuel, let me catch you up. Samuel's story started before he was born with Hannah making this heart cry, and then God answering that prayer and giving her the birth of a son. That was the first story. And then time lapsed, and we find him in the temple, and he's now serving under Eli as a boy. God shows up and speaks to him. And then we have another time lapse, and Samuel is now made the leader of Israel, the judge, the leader, the priest, and the prophet. And they see, they turn to Samuel, and he leads them against their enemies, the Philistines, and then leads the country for about 40 years. And then we got a picture of the last time, two weeks ago, of Samuel when the people came to him and said, you know what, great that you led us for these 40 years, you did a good job, however, you're sons don't follow in your ways. We want our own king. We want to be like all the other nations and have a leader over us like the other nations have. We want a king that we can pick. And God answers that prayer with a king by the name of Saul. Now the two chapters that lead up to 1 Samuel 12 is about the selection of Saul as king. If you wanted to look in the Bible and find some place where there was a democracy, you, that's the area to look at. Because they're looking for a king that they could vote to be their king. Some guy like Saul, who's taller than all the rest, who's stronger, or appears to be stronger than all the rest, who seems to attract attention, who cares about what people think, follows the popularity polls. Give me a king over us, that people would say, that we choose for ourselves. And then he can go fight our battles. And then he can go take care of the poor. He can go run the military. He can give us laws that we like to follow. But give us a king. This should sound familiar, by the way. Give us a king over the land that we choose for ourselves so we can do what we want. Does that sound familiar to you? They got one. But half the people, if you look back, half the people are for Saul. And half the people are against him. Oh, they, some like who he is. Others think, no, nah, he's not the guy. And there's this tension going on until an enemy shows up. And all of a sudden, when an enemy shows up and their life is on the line, Saul is moved by the Holy Spirit, by God's Spirit in him. And he calls the nation together and they rally together and they defeat the enemy. 330,000 soldiers back off this enemy, finally defeat him, and everybody says, hey, maybe Saul should be our king. And Samuel shows up. This is the end of chapter 11. Samuel says, great, finally 
you're in agreement. Now let's all show up at Gilgal, this special place just west of the Jordan River. Let's go to Gilgal and you can all once and for all make him your king. And they do that. Now Gilgal is a pretty special place, by the way. Just, just a little backdrop on that, just for those of you that like to study the Bible. Gilgal is the place where they gathered 12 stones out of the Jordan River and Joshua, when he led them across that river, they set up a monument to say, remember that God is your king. That's that spot. Gilgal is the place where prophets would go and remind the people, these two mountains, remind the people of the prophecies of God through Moses that these are all the blessings you'll get if you follow God. And these are all the curses you'll get if you don't. Gilgal was the place that they first inaugurated Saul. And now it's going to be the person, place that they go worship God and say, thank you for Saul, now we can go back to our home and do whatever we want. And it's also going to be the place where Samuel calls on the nation to repent of what they just did. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Follow along with me because what you're going to see here is God is not interested in your accolades or your accomplishments or your height or your weight or your, or your strength or all the things you've done. God is actually noticing our witness. Amen. And that's what you're going to see in this chapter. 1 Samuel 12. What God notices in a nation. Here's how it starts. Samuel said, he's got them all gathered. Saul has just been anointed king again. Everybody's sacrificing. Everybody's celebrating. Finally, we get to go do what we want to do. Finally, we got someone in power that's going to do what we ask them to do. Saul standing right there with Samuel. And Samuel says to all of Israel, I listened to everything you said to me, and I've set a king over you. And then he goes, now you have a king as your leader. You know, you're not using the judge. You're not using the one that God appointed. You're using this guy. And as for me, I'm old and gray, and here my sons are with me, and I've been your leader from my youth until this day. Now, here I stand. You testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed, Saul, whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey did I take? Wh whom have I cheated? Who am I oppressed? Wh whose hand have I accepted a bribe from to make me shut my eyes? We'll come back to that in a little bit. If I've done any of these things, I will make it right. And they all said, well, no, no, no. Samuel, it's not about you. <laughs> you haven't cheated or oppressed us. We just wanted a king for ourselves. We just wanted freedom to do whatever we wanted to do. You've not taken anything from anybody's hand. And Samuel said, the Lord is witness against you. And also his anointed Saul, I hope you're listening to this, that you've not found anything in my hand. He's witness, they said. And here's the thing I want to show you. I'm going to show you three points out of this text. I'm going to speak boldly and bluntly about this from our nation's standpoint. Are you, do you follow? Give me a little freedom, a little latitude today. This is not a political speech, although it's probably one that we should be reminded of every single time we have an election. This is not about what party you vote for. But it is about what the nation needs to remember. And we need to hear it right now. The Lord reveals the witness of its leaders. The Lord will reveal, eventually... Your witness, my witness, all of our witnesses when we lead in any capacity. I'm speaking to parents. I'm speaking to school teachers. I'm speaking to leaders in the industry. I'm speaking to leaders in media. I'm talking to those of you that lead in any kind of a situation, coach or yes, president, governor, Congress, whatever. Eventually, your witness will be discovered. And that's what Samuel is trying to demonstrate with Saul, the new king, right there. Your witness will be discovered. Now, what's a witness? Let me just make that clear. A witness is a public record of your beliefs, your actions, and your behaviors. It's a public record of what you are privately. Eventually, you can hide that for a while. You can kind of keep it under the 
So you can hold people back from really seeing it. You can play the game one way, but then hide the other. But sooner or later, it comes out. You know what I'm talking about, right? Forget which political party, because they both have had mistakes. Forget about bosses that you've worked for that are good or that are bad. We've all been there. Eventually, it comes out, yes? Two stories on that. One, last week, we were back in Ohio helping my mom move out of her house for 53 years. She's now fully retired. She was babysitting kids, and we moved her down to Florida with my brother, and all the family was there, and all of us were having a great time, and we're re reminiscing 53 years of memories in this place. There was at least four stories that came out about each of us that mom did not know. <laughs> My brother, who she's actually going to be with for a little while and live in the same, same city, he, he finally turns to me and says, oh, here we go, another Todd story. I was glad that I kept my stories quiet. Come on. Everybody have a story? You don't want anybody to know? When it comes to a leader, they will become public sooner or later. Years ago, and this isn't about a party again, I'm telling you, it's true across the board. There was a new president going to be elected. George Bush was running. The Democrats were looking for someone, a candidate, to run against him to defeat him. They were looking for their next Kennedy. They thought they had found him. And some of you are too young for this, but you can look it up in the history books. They thought they found him in a guy by the name of Gary Hart. One reporter started to ask him questions about his character and said, I hear that maybe there's things going on in your life, your private life, that are not right. And he says, no, 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 I'm great. In fact, read the story. I dare any of you reporters to come follow me and find out that there's nothing going wrong. And two reporters from the Miami Herald decided to take him up on that offer. And they started following him around. A couple weeks later, they got pictures of a woman coming out of his hotel room. Soon after that, same woman on his yacht. And many of you now know the story it came out where there was a lady and several that ruined his candidacy. And I'm just saying that one story, I could go down the road with pastors and leaders in business, and leaders in community, and teachers and administrators in a school system, and you can go down the list of all the people that have had their leadership fail because their witness revealed, was revealed eventually. People that I respect, I've seen it happen. Come on. And it can happen to you, and it can happen to me. And here's what you got to see in this story. Standing right next to Samuel is Saul. Oh, victorious in that battle. I wish he would have listened. Because we're going to turn around in the next chapter and see him fail to follow God's orders. And that will be revealed. We'll get into more of that next week. But you need to hear this clearly, parent, leader, coach, captain, church leader, your witness will be revealed for good or for bad. So Samuel has got the attention of the people. No, you have never done anything, nothing that you've ever done to violate your character, nothing you've ever done against the Lord. We just want a king for ourselves. We just want someone to take charge and solve our problems so we can do what we want to do. That's what they are saying. So then Samuel goes on. And he says to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. He's going to give them a little history lesson. He's going to remind them that, oh, by the way, it's not you who puts somebody in power. I, I got news for you. You may have picked a human king, but he is still king. So he goes through this story. Follow along. 
Now then, stand here because I'm going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous things performed by our God, our Lord, for you and your ancestors. Let's start with Jacob. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help. They were being oppressed. And the Lord sent Moses and Aaron. You didn't pick Moses. You didn't choose Aaron. In fact, you didn't even want Moses when he showed up. But he came and he brought all of our ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this land, this place. And then don't forget, the Lord, they forgot the Lord their God. And so he sold them. This is in Gideon's time. Sold them into the hand of 